Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and a very warm welcome. I'm delighted to be joined by Colonel Miri Oshi. She is a retired colonel in the Israeli Defense Forces and has a background in military intelligence. She is currently an associate professor with Reichman University. So thank you, ma'am, for taking your time and speaking to us. So before I want to uh, focus on the northern borders, I just want to ask you a little brief about uh, the recent escalation uh, between uh, Israel and Iran we have seen over the last week or so where Israel uh, has retaliated uh, while Iran chose to send drones, cruise missile and ballistic missiles and after that Israel uh, retaliated. So could you just give a little bit overview of what the situation is right now between Israel and Iran and is there any sign of more retaliations coming from Iran's side? Um, Iran has been um, acting against Israel covertly, meaning secretly, and through proxies for a dozen years. What happened over the last 10 days is that on April 14th, Iran openly, overtly attacked Israel from Iranian territory. So first to put it into perspective for everybody, the Iranian attack against Israel does not start on April 14th. The Iranian Revolutionary Guards, their capabilities and their proxies have been attacking Israel for years, certainly from October 7th. On April 14th, um, the Islamic regime directly from Iranian territory fired over 300 different types of projectiles against Israel. That is an enormous number. It is unprecedented. And it was different types. It was both UAVs, that's a drone, a type of drone, cruise missiles, and a different type of rocket. All three fired at Israel different timetables on their arrival. 99% of these projectiles were intercepted by different capabilities, both by the Israeli interceptors that are ground interceptors that were built and by airplane missile interceptors in a variety of ways. And at the end of this blatant attack, um, there were some missiles, mainly um, um, cruise missiles that penetrated and arrived in Israel. Um, there was one injured person, but in its own way, Israel's air defense air capability, together with an international coalition, stopped it. And um, according to the international world, Israel has not confirmed it. Um, on Friday night, April, there was an attack on Iranian soil. I do not believe Iranian media, Iranian official media, is that same Islamic regime. The Iranian media has been belittling, making smaller the attack that happened on Iranian territory and has been um, enlarging the attack that Iran did against Israel, meaning that they keep saying that they did very bad damage. They did not do damage in Israel only because of our air defense. And according to everything that's coming out, the attack that took place on Iranian soil, allegedly by Israel, um, attacked and destroyed radars that are near a nuclear facility. And essentially what that means is that if it is Israel, then Israel has the capability to attack on Iranian soil without any Iranian capability to stop it right next to the nuclear facility, which says a lot about Israel capability if they would want to do a larger attack. And As of now... We think it's all um, the open, overt portion seems to be down. But to be clear, the covert and by proxy absolutely continues. And this is where I want to uh, bring uh, to uh, your ask you actually about this: that uh, Iran has downplayed this attack very visibly. Uh, I was looking at the comments of the foreign minister, and he's asking which attack. 
but it, this has been right next to a nuclear facility, in fact. So in this case, uh, what we see, uh, Iran, of course, will downplay it for its own visibly public uh, media and how it want to play the optics. Uh, but in a sense, uh, will Iran actually have to recalculate its moves uh, to not attack directly from its own soil and rather use the proxies going forward, uh, looking at how Israel retaliated? No, it's a great it's a great question. So let's differentiate, okay, separate the military capabilities from the information capabilities. Both of them are within the world of warfare. And in this case, I would say that very clearly Israel's military capabilities, both in offense and in defense, the military capabilities of attacking and defending, are not in the same category as Iran, and Iran should take notice of that. In the information warfare, I think that Iran does a very, very challenging for us, meaning they do very well in the information warfare. They do well at portraying what they do as if it was legitimate defense, which it is not. They frame it in such a way so that everybody is asking, why is Israel retaliating and not asking, why is Iran attacking? And in that sense, what in the world is Iran doing? Because the world of Iran, Israel, as I said, is a continuing one. In the Iranian frame, Iran, this is the Iranian frame, Iran retaliated for the killing of Iranian Revolutionary Guards on Syrian um, soil on April 1st. But that's the Iranian frame, as if everything started on April 1st. No, no, no. Iran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards from Syria, from Lebanon, for that matter, from Yemen, from Iraq, have been physically fighting against Israel from October 7 in this war and long before that. And I say that because I think that Iran understands, I hope, that they are vulnerable, that this will deter them. But I want to be clear, they will continue, they, Iran, with their covert war. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the Al-Quds Force, and the proxies like Hezbollah, like the Houthis, like Hezbollah in Iraq. If I could ask you a little bit more on the Iranian perspective. Uh, while they choose to do this, uh, in some of the way, do you think uh, they're trying to actually divert the attention from their nuclear project while the world looks at the Israel-Iran conflict in some sort of a way? It's a great question that I don't have an answer for. I'll give you my speculation. Everybody's talking about miscalculation. And yet, in this case, I think that Iran miscalculated. Iran thought that they would attack us and kill Israelis on April 14th. And that was a huge miscalculation, both in the fact that they did not kill Israelis, thanks to our air defenses, and to their thinking that they would do so and be able to protect themselves. Meaning, I think that they were the ones miscalculating. They were the ones who were saying, um, in, in the own way that Israel is, is defining the rules of deterrence and and Iran says, no, 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 I'm the one deterring, I'll attack Israel, I'll show them what I have. And I think that they miscalculated, that they showed what they don't have. And they don't have, not in the attack, they have a lot of capabilities, but we have air defense and to be clear, they got through a bit, 99% were intercepted. If they do that again, some will get through, always. There's always that percentage. But overall, in the alleged Israeli attack, we attacked, if this is true, right next to a nuclear facility and they could do nothing. So it's a miscalculation there. I think that they actually thought that they are way stronger than they are and they wanted to show it. So now they need to downplay the Israeli and upplay their own. That's in the information world. Uh, it, did Iran also underplay a little bit about how the other Arab states will react to their attack? Because we saw a, a vast majority of Arab states did not uh, support this attack. And even Jordan actually helped uh, uh, Israel to defend uh, itself. 
So did Iran also thought since the war has been going on between Israel and Hamas, uh, the negative optics that Israel might have uh, accumulated in the Arab world will help them to retaliate at this stage, but grossly miscalculated. Great, great question again. So I think that Iran miscalculated again. And here I would say that Iran's actions, not just April 14th, but what I was talking about, the covert secret war, is not just against Israel. It's also been against the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Jordan is very threatened by those same Iranian Revolutionary Guards, same Al-Quds force. Jordan is very threatened by Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria, which is completely supported by the Iranian regime and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. And in addition, not just Jordan, but the other Sunni countries, not all of them, but certainly Saudi Arabia, some of the Gulf countries, the Emirates, Bahrain, not exactly Sunni, are threatened by the Islamic regime of Iran by that export of their version of the Islamic revolution, by the proxies, by violence that they establish and export. And I think that that is the miscalculation of Iran in that sense is that by doing so, Iran is building its own enemies even stronger, bringing them the, the, the different ones who are against Iran, the Islamic regime, into a closer coalition, like the one that we saw on April 14th against that um, attack that came into Israel. And to be very clear, Jordan is protecting Jordan. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. Those missiles, drones, and, 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 and capabilities flew over the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom itself, has been directly threatened. So it wasn't that they did it to necessarily help Israel. The interest is a Jordanian interest, and that's very important. It's about their own interest against Iran and not because they're just helping Israel. And moving to the northern borders a little bit uh, to understand what's happening with Hezbollah, uh, we see Iran uh, at this point of time, if doesn't directly retaliate, would prefer to go through Hezbollah or the Houthis. The Houthis will not cause, of course, a direct damage uh, to Israel as the Hezbollah would. Uh, given the fact right now that Iran has probably a deep uh, connection with uh, the Iraqis and the Syrians to go directly to the Lebanon and have a proper arm transfer, how much of that is a uh, concern to the Israelis at this point of time? So over the last 10 and even 15 years, there's been an event that Israel has called the Campaign Between the Wars. And this was in the last 10, even 15 years of very covert, not, I mean, secret, even though it was like there were attacks, Israel never claimed responsibility against the supply routes that you were describing. If it was on the Syria-Iraqi border, in Iraq, throughout Syria, and towards Lebanon, the supply routes to the different Shiite proxy forces to Hezbollah in Lebanon, and that was called the campaign between the wars. From October 7, Hezbollah has been using capabilities that they've built. We never could stop all of them. Whatever we stopped, we did. But we've always said there's an enormous amount of capabilities there. Hezbollah has been attacking Israel in Israel every single day from October 7. It isn't a future war. It's a multi-front war right now. Hezbollah attacked on October 7 with mortars and with... Um, um, different types of um, close range rockets. And since October 7th, including every single day, including today, with UAVs, with suicide drones, with anti tank guided missiles known as ATGMs, these are exact missiles that come up and around and we do not have early warning, et cetera. So when you say, what are we doing about the supply route? Israel is continuously trying to attack the supply route. We need to be aware that that is part of it, but Hezbollah already has enormous capabilities that are kind of like Hamas on steroids, and with the amount of capabilities that they have and the type of capabilities that they have. And so it's very challenging in its own way. 
but why why do you think that the international media uh, doesn't uh, in some sort of a way uh, and uh, down is downplaying uh, what hezbollah has been doing is it solely because the amount of harm that hamas has over the last uh, from october 7 has created has not been the northern borders and northern borders have been evacuated is that the reason okay right now deep it's kind of like we're going to do a different session of 17 hours on that one there it is a sore point so it's a variety of reasons it's a variety of reasons one and i'm giving them as 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 explanations it doesn't make me happy but it at least gives some kind of a a reason okay one is that the framing of israel is through the lens of israel against the palestinians what did i do when i started talking with you i immediately zoomed out and talked about iran the islamic regime the iranian revolutionary guard the al quds force the proxies there against the, the establishment and existence of the state of israel and nobody talks about that from october 7 the this war is framed as at the best israel against hamas which is one of the ways that i've heard it framed in india and i appreciate that because most of the war frames it, world frames it as israel against gaza it's not israel against gaza it's not israel against the palestinians it's israel against hamas and it's been from the beginning a multi front war but the frame is always done about israel against the palestinians and everything else as if it connects into that and when you try to break that mold when you try to break that frame there absolutely is an an area which is israel and the palestinians against israel is against the palestinians that's one element hamas is part of it it's not the only one but there's also hezbollah the proxies and iran and and it's not covered and to me it's a sore point i think of it if i mentioned before the iranian information warfare i would say that the palestinians this isn't hamas per se the palestinians biggest success is that for the last 35 years they've managed to make any mention of israel be about the palestinians and when you say no no it's not just about them everybody thinks you're ignoring the palestinians and when you say it's not about them everybody knows that you're ignoring the palestinians it's a very challenging arena but what will it take to actually uh, bring to the attention that uh, the war between israel and hezbollah is already on uh, does it needs a, a formal acknowledgement for for example has has israel to come and say that we will now attack israel and then it starts because at this point of time uh, there is a, a certain amount of let's say preemptive strikes from israel and we see uh, this barrage of rockets coming in uh, attacks been happening from the hezbollah side but uh, it's not an all out war uh, as per uh, the traditional sources that people buy so it's not an all out war i might call it a limited war i prefer the term war of attrition because it's a war that's going on every single day it's happening on israeli territory meaning hezbollah is attacking into israeli territory the way they're doing so is using all of their different projectiles some are anti tank that they use against buildings civilian vehicles they're attacking all of the different israeli towns and villages on the border they and they're very proud of it and and i would say to you right now deep go into hezbollah's english website el manar in english go into it today show it to everybody i i hate the fact that i disseminate their propaganda but you need to go into it to see what they're saying to understand that they are at war that they're going to present it as supporting the palestinians but when they show it you go into it they show all of israel all of israel everywhere they're attacking as illegal settlements meaning they are about the destruction of the state of israel which is also what hamas is about so they can say that they're doing it to support Hamas and in that sense I agree Hamas and Hezbollah are both calling for our destruction and you need to go and view the because they write it very clearly inside their website in English 
for you in India, for me in Israel, for the Western world in that sense, I don't want to say Western, for the English speaking world to see. And, and how do you change that? Um, as I said, I think that we do very poorly in Israel when it comes to the information warfare. But part of the challenge is that the international community, including right now, only frame Israel with the issue of the Palestinians in the room. So go in and see what the issue of the Palestinians, in this case, both Hezbollah and Hamas, openly call for the destruction of Israel. This isn't about resolution, two states side by side. No, 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 no. It is totally about annihilation, destruction, um, us being not illegitimate. We are not allowed to exist. I agree with you because, you know, uh, this is uh, exactly what the problem has been, uh, even uh, with a lot of Indian uh, people that I had a conversation with, because a lot of people haven't read the Hamas charter. Uh, and uh, th that's where uh, the confusion starts, because uh, the idea of a resistance force and their uh, representative of Palestinian people will uh, change the moment they read the charter and they see what they are calling for. Uh, but I want to understand a little bit from this that uh, where does uh, Hezbollah see itself? Uh, does it see itself in a way that they are secure because Israel will not enter Lebanon? Uh, but conversely, looking at what uh, Israel did uh, also enter in Gaza, uh, do they not uh, have this perpetual fear of uh, being attacked inside the territories? I'm going to answer, zoom out, zoom in. Hezbollah zoom out, want to destroy Israel. They say it openly. It's, as I said, in their website, go in and read it in English. But just like with Iran, A, they both think, and, and Hezbollah is very much the, um, the revolutionary inspired by the revolution of the Islamic regime of Iran. Um, Ratnadeep, they have time. They view time as being on their side. So we need to separate the immediate battles going on right now which they view as one step. And right now in this time, they don't want to expand it, perhaps because they feel that they're not strong enough, that Israel is stronger, that we would destroy them. It would be at a price to us for everybody to be clear. It isn't that they wouldn't do terrible damage to Israel, but they wouldn't destroy us. And if they can't destroy us physically right now, they're building up the capabilities like Iran, like the other proxies, and in the meantime, right now, they don't want to fight an open war because that would impact their capabilities, okay? But long term, they know from their point of view, 20 years, 40 years, 100 years, Israel will cease to exist. That's what they write and say, Hezbollah says that. And in this case, Hamas says the same thing. And I want to separate. I absolutely feel that I, Israel, me, Miri, support Palestinians and their quest for self-determination, for independence, without destroying myself. Hamas and Hezbollah want a Palestine that destroys Israel so that Israel does not exist, and they say it openly. So uh, the course going forward, I have a couple of last questions, and one of them is, so the course going forward <laughs> for Israel is uh, to continue the preemptive strikes, uh, destroy the offensive capabilities in some, some sort of a way for Hezbollah uh, and not take this forward because uh, I'm sure from an Israeli perspective as well, they wouldn't want a two-front war. Going forward. Wow. It, it's actually a bigger question than a little one. Israel is in a horrible war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Why do I say a horrible war? We've all seen the casualties. I don't belittle that. But in this case, for me as an Israeli, it is about, at this stage, 136 Israelis held in the Gaza Strip. And there is no nice, negotiating, easy way out. There are only ugly ways out. Ugly means you negotiate and you let out of Israeli jails all of the prisoners, how can you do so? They were arrested, put on trial, put in jail for terrorism. How can you let them all out? If you don't let them out, 
that Hamas will not let out the hostages. But it's even worse. I don't believe Hamas. I don't believe that they will let out all of the hostages, even if I would let out all of the prisoners. So in this dirty, horrific, terrible war, I need to get back my citizens. But now, baby, it could have been me or you. It could have been a baby. There's an 86-year-old. There's a year-old baby. There are people in their 20s, in their 30s. and These are citizens. The, all their crime is that they lived in towns and villages that are near the border. That's horrible. And I, the state of Israel, need to get them back. And because of that, when we talk about Hezbollah and the northern border, when we talk about Iran and the Islamic regime, that it's all going to keep on going, but in the immediate sense of what will happen, Israel needs to get our hostages back. We need to continue to destroy the October 7 capability. That's a terror capability. We need to be sure that Hezbollah and the northern border will not do an October 7 because they were preparing that kind of capability against Israel. And we need to look and see that the proxies and the Islamic regime that enables them all is not the one pulling the strings, that they're not the one defining the agenda, that Israel and the coalition worldwide is the one pushing terror organizations and the Islamic regime of Iran into the corner, and not that the terrorists are the ones defining the rules of the game. So what do I expect? Us continuing to fight in the Gaza Strip and trying to get to our hostages. Us continuing to fight against Hezbollah and making sure that they do not do a land cross-border attack, that, that capability. That's the Radwan force, which is in Lebanon, the Hezbollah force. And us continuing the covert secret war, very physical, a covert secret war against the Islamic regime, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, and all of the proxies. That's 2024. And the last thing that I want to ask you uh, before I let you go is, uh, I know the northern borders, uh, the adjoining areas, some of them have been evacuated and we see citizens have been pushed into safer areas. Uh, but uh, this is again not a war that's going on. It's a, it's, it's a uh, it's kind of a retaliation uh, and uh, strikes and again uh, Hezbollah is uh, sending uh, in uh, projectiles and being defended. So uh, how long uh, till this point where there is some sort of stability? Uh, and as an Israeli, I wanted to ask you, I, I promise not to bring politics, but I want to ask you because it's kind of important to ask you that, uh, is it an Israeli uh, the politics of it, uh, looking at how the government has been? Uh, how does it uh, make a, a certainty that it doesn't take anything additional uh, for optics? Uh, that it doesn't escalate the situation further. So I'll start with the first one and I'll go into the second one. That's fine in that sense. Um, as we speak right now, and because I'm talking to uh, an office and, and, and uh, you know, to India, and, you know, I don't know, what are you, 1 billion, 400 million people? I never know every day. I'm sure there's, you know, a lot more. And I say that happily, not unhappily. But at the end, Israel is all of 10 million people. That's not a lot. And in our northern border, if you look at a map, all of the communities have been evacuated. They were evacuated so that an October 7 attack would not happen to them by Hezbollah. And in Israel, that's a huge amount of num um, amount of people. It was 80,000 people because it's a city of 24,000 people and lots of additional towns and villages. And they're living with relatives in hotels. It's not nice. It doesn't, it doesn't, people say hotels, they think that's, it's horrible. And in Israel, our, our government, our people, our citizens, we cannot continue to do so. And of course, all of the communities down south that were attacked are all evacuated ever since. So the government in that sense not only needs to bring back the hostages and make sure that Hamas and Hezbollah cannot do a ground attack, they also need to contend with rebuilding those communities so people can go home. Governments have policies. I can agree and I can disagree. That's why you right now in India have the most amazing democratic elections that there are in the world. You decide on who's in parliament and who will the government be. That's a choice. And in Israel, it doesn't matter if I support or don't support it. A few additional parties joined 
the government because of the war itself. Yes, they have policies. I absolutely think that their ideology impacts it. I can be against that ideology. Have, having said that, I can't change that. The only way you can change that in a democracy is through protest and through elections. And Israelis are protesting and we don't have scheduled elections, which means that in the meantime, that's the policy that's gonna be there. And I don't have a better answer to that. I accept it as us being a democracy. I may not like all of the voices, but like in any democracy, like in any democracy, politicians make statements. That's not actions. So stop amplifying the statements and amplify the decisions and actions that are made by the security cabinet. Because at the end, um, we have some very extreme ministers in the government and they make statements, but that does not mean that, they're that what they said is policy. It means they're politicians saying things. And I follow carefully the decisions that are made by the Israeli war security cabinet that includes within it a variety of voices those voices are going to be around that table as well. They're going to be part of that decision-making as well. But it isn't that they say a statement, which is horrible, and that that is Israeli policy. We need to see those different aspects when it comes to how Israel is presented, um, both domestically and worldwide. Well, that's all the questions that I had. So thank you so much for taking your time and speaking. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate it. Um, we have a big holiday in a few days. So happy holiday. Passover for us, and I hope that everybody does well. Thank you, Thank you Rajan. Thank you.